in Grace Chapel this month, it is the month of the manifestation of his promises. And we've been talking about the manifestation of God's promises since the beginning of the month. And I pray for you as the Lord has prophesied before this month that this will be the month of the manifestation of his promises. I pray that God's promises as you desire and ask of him will manifest in your life this month in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Before I take the sermon, I just want to remind us that this Saturday is the Area Workers Training and Empowerment Day. And so I want to encourage everyone that serves in Grace Chapel in one um, area or the other to please attend this training. It is important that you attend and I'm sure that you will not regret it in Jesus name. So please set aside the time. It's starting at 3 p.m. We have announced 4 p.m but the time had to be changed because of the content of the conference. And we do not want to hold people down at dinner time. And so the conference is going to start at 3 p.m. Please prepare to attend on Zoom. It's going to be on the Grace Chapel platform. And so please just log back into our platform and people from other churches will join us as we do the conference. God bless us all. This morning, by the grace of God, God has laid upon my heart to share on the topic, hindrances to the manifestation of God's promises. Hindrances to the manifestation of God's promises. This is just going to be part one. And in a couple of weeks time, I will be sharing the second part of the message. This morning, I'd like to take my text, if you please, from Numbers 13 verse one and verse two, and then go straight down to verse 26 and read to verse 33. Numbers 13, verses one to two and 26 to 33. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel from each tribe of their fathers, you shall send a man, everyone a leader among them. Verse 26, now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told him and said, we were at the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let's go up at once and take possession for we are well able to overcome it. But men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out saying, the land through which we have gone to spy a spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people who we saw in it are people of great stature. They, there we saw the giants. The descendants of Anak came 
from the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. This scripture shows how the children of Israel handled God's promise in this particular instance. When they were about to experience or receive the manifestation of God's promises, they began to have different opinions. My question to you this morning, how do you handle God's promises? In every situation of your life, how do you handle, relate to, engage with, embrace, or otherwise with the promises of God? The Bible is filled with the promises of God from Genesis to Revelation. We read of normal people that received the promises of God, ordinary people. These promises are sealed by the highest authority which is God's word. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 13 says, for when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself. And he fulfilled this promise to Abraham in the face of every negative contrary natural conditions by giving him the child of promise in his old age. Let us talk for a moment. Let's look at what a promise is. I know that David gave a definition last week and it's a perfect definition. I'm going to also explain a little bit more on the back of that this morning. A promise is a declaration or assurance that someone will do something or that particular thing will happen. Now, this declaration gives the person to whom the promise is made a right to expect, expect to claim the performance of that promise. In law, a declaration, whether verbal or written, is a covenant. It's a covenant by which the promisor binds himself. And this gives the promisee, the person that is receiving the promise, a legal right to demand a fulfillment. Now, if you look at God's promises in this light, that is God's declaration and God's assurance that he would do something or that that particular thing will happen. And that God expects that you and I, to whom he made the promise, would expect and also claim the performance of that promise. We have the right to ask for the fulfillment of the promise of God. In Psalms 89 verse 34, the, the living Bible, the, <clears throat> the Bible says, no, I will not break my covenant. I will not take back one word of what I said. This is God speaking. He said, he will not take back one word that he has spoken. God promise, God, God's promises are all over scripture. In each promise, he pledges something. Something that will or will not be done. Something that he gives or something that will come to pass. And these promises are not flippant casual promises such as we make. These promises of God are rock solid. They are unequivocal commitments made by God himself because God is faithful. 
The recipients of divine promises can have full assurance. You and I can have full assurance that God will do what he has promised, what he has pledged, what he has covenanted. He will do it and it will be realized. That's what Numbers chapter 23 verse 19 says. God's promises are his words and they are sure. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, they are yes and amen. And God also said by himself in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 12b, he said, I will hasten my word to perform it. Meaning, I will make haste to fulfill my promises in your life. The early Christians placed great importance on the promises of God to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. And they kept reciting it and they kept referring to it. And we should, because it's the same God yesterday, today and forever. God has promised a lot of things to us believers. And believers can claim all these promises that God has already made. Like you know, and I think David mentioned this, not in the same words, but the same thing anyway last week. That the integrity of a person is dependent, the integrity of a promise, sorry. The integrity of a promise is dependent on the person who made that promise. What is the character of the person that made the promise? Does he have the capacity, the capability, the ability to fulfill that promise? If we can say yes to this, then that promise will be fulfilled. So one may want to ask, why should I believe in God's promises? Why should I expect it to come to pass? Let's look at it based on character, based on ability, capability, as I just mentioned. The first one I want to consider is what Titus wrote in Titus 1, chapter 2, I mean verse 2, that God cannot lie. This is the character of the person that has made these promises. He cannot lie. Unlike man, God does not flip-flop on his words. He never changes his mind. In him, there is no variableness or shadow of turning. That's what the Bible says. And Numbers 23 verse 19 says that God is no man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. As he said it, and shall he not do it? Or as he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Surely he will. When he speaks, he makes it good. Unlike men who can change their minds the way they change their clothes, God does not change his mind and he does not lie. He is constant, he is consistent, he is truthful, he is holy, he is a righteous God. Number two, he is the ruler of the kingdom of men. Because he's the ruler of the kingdom of men, he has authority, he has power, he has the provision to make his promise good. In Hebrews chapter 6 verse 13, the Bible says, For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no greater, no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, he has the authority in Daniel chapter 4, verse 17 and verse 32b, the Bible says, the most high rules in the kingdom of men. He is the one that rules in the kingdom of men. Psalm 22, verse 28 says, for the kingdom is the Lord's and he rules over the nations. He is the ruler in the kingdom of men. He is the ruler over the nations. He is the ruler in the universe. He makes decisions in the kingdom of men. He gives approval in the kingdom of men. He has the authority and he has the capacity to fulfill his promises. So yes, we should expect it to come to pass. Yes, we should believe in God's promises. Number three, his words are potent. 
They carry power, influence, and effect. They are not empty words. They are not void. Isaiah 53 verse 11 says, So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing which, for which I sent it. His words created the world. It is powerful. It is creative. His words carry power for accomplishment. His words carry the ability to prosper. The word shall. I checked from the English dictionary and also in law is an instruction and a command and an obligation, not a suggestion. And so when God says, so shall my word be, so shall, so shall, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It says, it shall not return to me void. It says, but it shall accomplish. It shall accomplish. And it shall prosper. It shall prosper. It's not a suggestion. It means that is what is going to happen. It shall accomplish. It is obligated to accomplish and to prosper. There is no other choice. That's what is going to happen. And so when God sends his word, when he makes that promise, it will prosper. It will be accomplished. And so, yes, you should believe in God's promises and you should expect it to happen. Number four, he owns everything. He owns everything. He made everything and he owns everything. If you look at Galatians chapter 14, verse 22 from the Amplified Version, it says, but Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand and sworn an oath to the Lord God most I, the creator and the possessor of heaven and earth. God is the creator and the possessor of heaven and earth. Another translation says the owner and the possessor of heaven and earth. If he is the processor of heaven and earth, he owns everything. He's wealthy. Psalm 50 verse 10b says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. If one who has no food to eat promises you food, you know there is no hope there. If one who has no roof over his head promises you a mansion, you know that they are just empty words. But if the owner and the processor of the earth promises you anything, you know he has the capacity to give that thing. You know he has the authority to give it to you. You can hope and trust in that promise. What is that promise of God that you think is too big? God has the capacity and he has the authority to give it to you. Number five, he is generous. He is generous. Do you know that not everyone that is wealthy is generous? Some are wealthy, but don't give anything. But God is wealthy and he is generous. The Bible says in Psalm 68 verse 19a, it says, blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits. He gives us benefits, not in trickles, but in loads. It's very generous. Psalm 84 verse 11 says, for the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. He will not withhold anything. He's very generous. I think I have proved my point. With these five points I have made, we have established the fact that he can be trusted to fulfill his promises because of who he is and because of what he does. He has the ability to fulfill his promises. He's dependable. He never lies. And so do not doubt the Lord. Do not doubt his commitment to his promises. Do not doubt his promises because he will fulfill them. If there is no problem 
with the promisor. If there's no problem with the one that is giving the promises, why are we not receiving the promises? Why are the promises not manifesting? Why are the promises not being fulfilled? in the lives of God's children. I want us to look very closely to our text this morning. This morning, I will bring up four points, and then in a couple of weeks, we will continue from the same scripture. Now, the four points I'm going to give this morning, I call them the four S's that hinders the manifestation of God's promises. The four S's, letter S. The first one is shallowness. Shallowness means lack of death. The story that Jesus Christ gave in Mark's gospel, chapter four, the story of, um, within the parable of the sower, it talks about the stony ground. The stony ground is a shallow ground. And it talks to about the, the condition of the heart. A heart that has no depth, a heart that has no depth, will not hold on to God's promises. Let's look at that scripture, Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, verse 5 to 6, and verse 16 to verse 17. It says, Some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it, scourged, it was scourged. <clears throat> And because it had no root, it withered away. Verse 16. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground, who when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness. And they have no root in themselves. So endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises, for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. What am I saying? Some read or even hear the, pro the word of God. They hear God's promises. They know about God's promises. They are excited about it. They do not have a revelation of the word. It's just about the excitement. It's about the euphoria. It's about the emotions. So when tribulations come, they cannot hold on to the promises of God because they do not have a revelation of it and they cannot apply their faith to it. They give up on the promises. They go into self-help or self-protection mode. They look for help and answers and solutions where there is none. We see this in our text today. Numbers 13, if you look at verse 27 to verse 29, the spies came back and they said to Moses and Aaron, they say, yes, the land truly flows with milk and honey. Look at the fruit from the land. Wow. Look at the clusters of grapes. Look at the pomegranate. Look at the figs that we brought back. Amazing land. Oh, the promise of God is so beautiful. Oh, the promise of God is amazing. Oh, it is fruitful land. Oh, it is wonderful, amazing, oh, good land. But then the bot came in. They saw a bot in the promise of God. They said the people that dwell there are strong. They said the cities are fortified. What were they doing here? They were walking by sight. They did not apply their faith to the word of God's promise. Even though they saw the promise, they saw exactly what God said he would give to them. They saw that there was no lie in it. Yet all they saw were the obstacles. What took the uppermost part of their uh, uh, um, report was the obstacles, the difficulties, the persecution, the tribulation, the fights that they would have to fight. 
the battles that they will have to, to battle. And so they were shallow. They were not willing to pay the sacrifice and the cost to receive the promise of God. In verse 31, it says, we cannot go against the people of the land. They are stronger than we. In other words, the promise of God is amazing. But that's where it stops. No manifestation, no fulfillment. It is too much trouble. The sacrifice and the cost is too inconvenient. It is too great. Too much effort is required. I'm not sure that he will fulfill this promise. He probably brought us, off, he brought us out of Egypt for nothing. God have mercy. Shallow Christians, they were. Shallow Christians, they were. Numbers 23 verse 19 B says, as he said it, will he not do it? Has he spoken it? Will he not make it good? Whatever he speaks, it makes good. Whatever he promises, he makes good. Do you know that the church is full of shallow Christians with this kind of shallow thinking that the children of Israel had at the edge of their miracle? The church is full of shallow Christians who are all about the emotions, not about the word of God. Are you one? Before you say a quick no, let's look at some evidence of shallowness in the life of a Christian. A shallow Christian puts Christianity on cruise control. You know what cruise control is in a car? You put your car in a particular speed and you don't need to press the throttle anymore. The car will drive at that speed and continue to drive at that speed. If there is an obstacle in front, it will slow down. When that obstacle moves away, it picks up and goes back to that speed by itself. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to place your leg on anything. I like driving cruise control when I'm on motorway. But some people are living their lives like the cruise control. No effort. They don't want to make any effort at all. When you see someone who has a Bible, but don't read much of it, he's satisfied with what he's heard from the pastor in church. He's satisfied what he's heard from, with what he's heard from other Christians around him. He does not bother to dig deep. It, it, it does not, because he doesn't dig deep, he has not grasped the word of God and the promises of God. You are seeing a shallow Christian. When you see a Christian who does not bother to pray and he deceives himself to say, God's got my back and he knows all that I need anyway, so I don't have to say it. He knows all that you need, but he said, ask. You are looking at a shallow Christian. When you see a Christian, that keeps all his money for himself. He does not give to people who need. He does not give to God's righteous cause. He does not give to missionaries. He does not give to his own church. You are looking to, at a shallow Christian. If you see someone who attends church only when it fits into his schedule, when he has nothing else to do, and he wakes up early on that day, you are looking at a shallow Christian. When you are looking at a Christian who does not sign up to serve in any way because serving gets in the way of things that they want to do. I mean, serving gets in the way of the things that they want to do. You are looking at a shallow Christian. When you see somebody who does not let a Christian, who does not let people know that he's a Christian, you are seeing a shallow Christian. When you look at a Christian, who only wants to attend the service with many people there and does not commit to a small group or to a Bible study, you are looking at a shallow Christian. Hello, are you a shallow Christian? It's easy to just look the part. Instead of drilling down to know Jesus more. It's easy to look the part. Instead of drilling down to know the power of his resurrection and know the fellowship of his suffering. 
A deep walk with God helps you to know that even though it may tarry, even though it may be impossible, the promise of God will surely come to pass. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 that we read this morning and we prayed with this morning says don't give up, don't be weary, don't be tired, don't faint because reaping will come in due course. A shallow Christian is one that expects instant miracles and does not understand that sometimes he has to wait. The moment there is delay, he begins to doubt the promises of God. Shallowness is a hindrance to the manifestation of God's promise. The second S is self-perception. How do you perceive yourself? Self-perception involves the way a person sees or feels about things. There are many examples in the Bible of self how self-perception cause individuals not to believe in God's promises. In the scripture that we read today, the children of Israel in this scripture perceive themselves as not strong, not as strong as the Jebusites, the Amorites, and so on, the Hittites, and so on and so forth. They perceive themselves as weaker than the Canaanites and all of them. Secondly, they perceive themselves to be grasshoppers before the giants of Canaan. They perceive themselves as not able. We are not able. That's what they said. How do you perceive yourself? Because that will impact whether you receive the promise of God or not. Whether the promise of God will manifest in your life at all. Because unbelief will stop you from receiving or believing the promises of God. How do you perceive yourself? Do you see yourself as a grasshopper? Do you see yourself as not able? Do you see yourself as inferior? Do you see yourself as beaten down? Do you see yourself as not capable? Do you see yourself as weak? How do you see yourself? Self-perception. And also self-perception, perception of the situation. Is they said, we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which came of the giants. And we were in our own sights as grasshopper. So we were in their sight. Not only did they perceive, have a wrong self-perception about themselves, they also perceived wrongly of how the people saw them. They said, so we were in their sight. I wonder how they knew that. Because I do not believe that they had a conversation with them since they were afraid of them. We also see in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, we also see how Sarah perceived that God will not give her a child. She self-perceived that God was not going to give her a child. And so she attempted to fulfill God's plan and promises with a substitute. In Genesis chapter 16 verse 2, she gave Abraham her maid. Why? She perceived that God is not going to give her a child. Wrong perception, wrong self-perception. We also see an example in 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 11 and verse 12. The example of Naaman. His perception could have hindered him from the promise of God for healing, if not for his maid servant. That scripture says, but Naaman was wroth and went away and said, behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, and strike his hand over the place, and recover the leper, and not the Abena and Farpa, uh, rivers of Damascus, better than all the rivers in Israel. May I not wash in them and be clean? The Bible says so, he turned and went away in rage. He would have remained a leper, if not for his maid who knew God and believes in God's promises. 
How many times have you gone before a servant of God and the servant for healing, for example, and the servant of God says, Tell you be healed in Jesus' name. Amen. And then you open your eyes and you look left and you look right and you look up and down and you look at your Bible and you look at the servants of God and you say, is that all? Is that all? Because you think that God works according to the numerous words that we speak in prayer. No, God works to fulfill his promise. Simple. What is your perception? When men have wrong self-perceptions, they lose out on God's promises. I pray that you will not lose out in Jesus' name. Number three, suffering. One of the things that can cause a man to lose out on God's promises is suffering and how you handle suffering. We know that one of the greatest difficulties in life is suffering and coping with suffering. It has been said, if, all, if you really love God, do your best to serve him, your life will be free from suffering. But this is not true. It's not even scriptural. Because the Bible says tribulation will come. What God has promised is that he will be with us in it. He'll be with us and never leave us. He will not forsake us. Suffering can show up at any time, anywhere and to anybody. It comes in all sizes and varieties, big and small. Some last for a short time and some last for a, long, a longer time. It's easy to fall into the trap of the enemy when we are suffering. We begin to feel abandoned by God. We get frustrated with God. We begin to doubt God's love for us. We begin to drift away from God gradually. Why? Because of suffering. But that is the very time that you must remember God's word. That's the very time that you must remember God's promises. God has promised in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 5b, that it will never leave us nor forsake us. We doubt this when we are suffering. Do not, do, do not doubt. He promised that he cares for us and he will bear our burdens. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7 says, cast all your cares upon him for he cares for you. We believe that he does not care for us whenever there is suffering. That is a lie of the devil. We doubt this very much in our suffering and it hinders the manifestation of God's promise. Because when you don't, what you don't believe, you don't receive. God has promised to hear our prayers in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 to verse 15, where he says, and this is the confidence we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. During suffering, people forget the scripture. We doubt that prayer is effective. I've been asked many times by Christians, does God still answer prayer? Yes, he does. But sometimes... We have to wait. The only way to endure suffering and embrace God's promises is through deep faith in him. If we see the example of Job, Job said in Job 1.22, I'm the Bible says, it said, in all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. When you are going through suffering, do you charge God foolishly? Do you say he doesn't love you? Do you disbelieve his word? Or do you stand and say what Job said in Job 13, 15, that though he slay me, yet will I trust him? but I will maintain my ways before him. Today, I encourage you, 
despite the suffering, despite the struggle, despite the difficulty, despite the problems, embrace God's promises. Bring them to view. Remind him of his promises and he will fulfill it in the name of Jesus. The last S that I'm going to mention this morning is sin. Sin involves the transgression of God's law. 1 John chapter 3 verse 4 says, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness and sin is lawlessness. There are several ways that sin can keep us from embracing God's promises. I'll just mention a few. Sin is always accompanied by fear, shame, guilt, humiliation, and those things drive us away from God's promises. After sin entered the life of Judas, what did he do? He was so ashamed, he felt so guilty, he went to go and hang himself. Matthew 27 verse 5 says that he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Surely Judas must have heard Jesus when he shared the parable of the prodigal son recorded in Luke chapter 15 verse 11 to 32. He was aware of the father's acceptance of his son when he returned home after he had seen plenty, sinned abundantly. But what did Judas do? He abandoned God's promise. He abandoned what he knows about the father that he will receive and accept him back. And he went to kill himself. And this also goes to self-perception. He could not see himself forgiven. He thought what he had done was terrible. So there's no how that God will forgive him. And he killed himself. Sin also brings self-condemnation. Self-condemnation will prevent you and will blind you from embracing God's promises. Judas saw Jesus forgive sins throughout his ministry. But because he was condemning himself, he couldn't ask for forgiveness. It is the reason why some today cannot receive God's forgiveness because they have condemned themselves. They say that they have done too much. They have sinned too much. They have done too much wrong for God to forgive them. And so they do not bother to ask for forgiveness. May God deliver you all today from self-condemnation so that you can see the manifestation of God's promises in your life in Jesus' name. Sin also drives us away from God. Isaiah 59 verse 1 to 2 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that he cannot save, nor his ear heavy, that he cannot hear. But our iniquities have separated us, have separated us. Your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. Sin drives us away from God. The, the, this, the, the sin ultimately hinders us from believing and holding to the promises of God. It hinders us from even seeing the manifestation of God's presence because he puts us away. He drives us away from God. In conclusion, brethren, remember the character, the capability, the ability of the person that has made the promise. Secondly, do not let shallowness, your self-perception, your suffering or sin keep you away from holding fast to the precious promises of God. Proverbs 4, 13, and this is my last scripture, says, take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go. Keep her, for she is thy life. Amen. Maybe there's someone this morning watching this service or in this service, you are full of shame, guilt, condemnation because of sin and because of your wrongdoings that you can recognize. I have good news for you today. You can be forgiven. The Bible makes us to understand from Romans chapter three verse 10 to 12 and verse 23, that everyone 
that no one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. All of us have sinned. We have turned away. We have become useless. No one does good, not a single one. Everyone has sinned and has fallen short of God's glorious standard. We are all sinners needing a savior. But the Bible says, the Bible also makes us understand that there is consequence for sin. The wages of sin is death, Romans chapter 6, verse 23. But the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. So our Lord Jesus Christ came and he died for our sins. He paid the price for our death. So we don't have to die and be separated from God forever. He showed his great love. God showed his great love by sending the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that God loves the world, John 3.16. That he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus Christ has paid for your sins, so you don't have to pay again. You don't have to suffer the consequences anymore. All you have to do is to confess with your mouth, according to Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. Because everyone that calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I wish to invite you this morning to confess your sins before the almighty God. He has already promised you forgiveness. It is one of his promises, his promises. He has promised forgiveness of sins. It does not matter how deep how wicked, how terrible the sin is. He has promised forgiveness ahead of the time that you, you even committed the sin. And so this morning, I encourage you, even as you are watching me and hearing my voice, to go ahead and begin to confess your sins before him. You can do that this very moment. Ask for his forgiveness. Surrender everything to him. Tell him, I know I'm a sinner. I know I cannot help myself. I have been deceived that you will never forgive me or accept me. But this morning, I have realized that one of your promises is that you will forgive me and you will accept me. And so, Lord, I confess my sins to you this morning. Mention it to the Lord and say, Lord, please forgive me. If you are ready to take that step this morning, I would like you to pray with me. As I say a prayer, please repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and that you rose from the dead on the third day for my sins. I turn away from my sins today and I invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you for the rest of my life. This very moment, Lord Jesus, I accept you as my personal savior and my Lord. Come into my life. Take control of my life from now on. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I thank the Lord that you have made that decision and you have prayed that prayer this morning. I say congratulations to you. I assure you that you have made the best decision for your life. I want you to take a photo of the details that is on your screen right now. Or write them down if you can write fast. And please make a contact, endeavor to be in touch with us this week. Either by email, you can go to the, our website and click on contact us 
and send a message and put your contact in it, or you can call or send a text message to the phone number of your, on your screen. And we shall continue to pray for you and we would encourage you in your newfound faith and in your journey with God. God bless you.